Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this conversation, We Built Reality, How the Social Sciences Have Transformed the World with Dr. Jason Blakely. Uh, I'm Joe Waters. I'm the CEO and co-founder co -founder of Capita, and I uh, am pleased to welcome you this afternoon, of course, but I'm happy to also share with you uh, what Capita is. Capita is a creative space to explore how the great cultural and social transformations of our day affect young children and foster new ideas to ensure a future in which children and their families and indeed all of society flourishes. We provide insight into pressing challenges and great transformations to leaders, thinkers, innovators, and all those working to positively change the future for our children and families. We convene free thinking cross-sector leaders working for a brighter future for children and families and we invest in the work of journalists, artists, and other creatives who are writing the story of our children's futures. Dr. Jason Blakely is an associate professor of political science at Pepperdine University. His expertise is in political philosophy and hermeneutics. He is the author of We Built Reality, How Social Science Infiltrated Culture, Politics and Power, published this year by Oxford University Press, and Alistair McIntyre, Charles Taylor, and the Demise of Naturalism. He earned his PhD at the University of California in, in, in Berkeley. Jason, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Joe, I appreciate it. Let's dive right in. Uh, you argue that the social sciences do not neutrally describe the world, but play a critical role in shaping or constructing the world. Uh, what do you mean by this? So, Part of the book was this kind of, um, you might almost say like an experiment in what it would look like to turn around the, the basic premises that we have when we read social science. I think the basic view when you read social science is it's a description of a world out there and it sort of exists outside of the world out there in sort of a laboratory-like space. And I wanted to turn around that assumption and instead look at social science as a form of meaning making where the social scientists are very much inside of history, culture, politics. And what does it look like if I sit down to read social scientific texts, and instead of sort of treating them as outside of politics, outside of culture, outside of economics, I treat them as within the streams of meaning that um, participate in the formation of our culture and politics. Um, and so partly what I mean is that the social sciences have meaning making dimensions. I could say a lot more about this, but they have meaning-making dimensions. Human beings dwell in meanings. We live in meanings the way we live in houses. Um, and social science is some of the furniture and walls and roof and whatnot of those meanings. We, we dwell within our social theories as well. And I think that a lot of people don't really recognize that. That takes a kind of um, leap uh, in understanding to see that. That's great. And you, I want to get concrete, um, but I also want you to just go ahead and help us understand what you mean when you talk about hermeneutics, because for the, the lay audience, that may not be a term that is familiar, but is critical to understanding uh, your work here. Yeah, and that, that is critical, and it is sort of jargon, and I try to stay away from too much jargon in the book, uh, because I do think that it's an important question that's being explored for for just amateur readers who are not necessarily academics or in academia. In academia, hermeneutics is an extremely well-known term, especially within the humanities and philosophies de philosophy departments. Uh, the shortest way to put hermeneutics is it's a long tradition that reflects upon the art of interpretation, the art of interpreting texts, the art of interpreting meanings. But hermeneutics has expanded within, say, the last century or more in order to be also an art of interpreting social and political reality. So hermeneutic philosophy holds that in order to understand social reality and political reality, I need to read it a little bit like a text. Mm -hmm. And so one of the assumptions of hermeneutics is that there's what philosophers call a text analog, that when you walk around in social reality, say you're walking down the street, you're actually reading social reality all the time. You're reading basic things that seem sort of obvious, like say uh, in our own culture, signage on the road, uh, where you can park, where you can't park, but you're also reading people. You're reading how they're dressed. Uh, you're reading how they carry themselves. 
um, you yourself are sort of embodying or projecting meaning. So you're kind of living a, a text, or if, you, if that sounds too sort of high flying, it, you're kind of doing a sort of social theater. It doesn't mean that you're acting or being fake per se. It just means that we act out our cultures and our meanings. And so hermeneutics is this broad philosophical tradition, it goes back to people like Martin Heidegger, Hans Georg Gadamer, these really important uh, philosophers from the 20th century. It's a living tradition that says, look, you want to understand politics, you want to understand economics, you want to understand even your own relationships. You're going to have to understand the art of interpretation. What does it mean to decipher the meanings that people embody, that the world around you embodies? And in some ways, what I did with social science is I turned the tables on mainstream social science. As someone who belongs to the hermeneutic tradition, I just said, what would it look like if I just read social science tracts as though they were hermeneutic artifacts, as though they were uh, meanings, meanings in the world that I need to interpret and decipher, what do they tell me about my social reality? And that's a lot of the title of the book, We Built Reality, is how do we build our social reality in part through social scientific theories? How, how did we create the world we live in? We don't build all of reality. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not someone who thinks that. The hermeneutic tradition doesn't necessarily hold that we build all of reality. There are parts of reality that are not built, if you like, they're given. But social reality is a function of our cultural um, life and is expressive of things that we build and it needs interpretation according to hermeneutics. So let's, let's talk about one issue in particular that you, you, you address in the book and that is policing. And given what we've seen this summer, the murder of George Floyd, the attempted murder this week of Jacob Blake, it, it seems very appropriate to start there. And in chapter five of the book, you argue that advocates of zero tolerance policing are pervaded by worry about how to engineer and control what they believe are hidden criminal energies concealed within individuals. So has, has social science broken windows, policing, zero tolerance, whatnot, helped us get to this point where the rate of, uh, at which Black Americans are killed by police is more than twice as high as the rate for white Americans? Yeah, I mean, thanks for that question. Short answer is yes. So the book basically, the book has philosophical things it's doing, and it also has sort of sociological things it's doing. And one of the sociological things it does is if you read social science in this way, you kind of get a map of our time. It's not the only map of our time, but it's a certain sort of unrecognized map of our time. If you start reading social science texts and thinking, how do they contribute to the building of the world that, that we occupy, that we dwell within? And uh, as you said, chapter five covers the way that different social scientific theories were involved in the construction of the current um, politics of policing and race in our society. And I think a lot of people don't realize that the way that we police isn't just the timeless way of policing. It's a particular cultural way of policing. That's difficult to see because oftentimes we think that what we're doing is either the only way to do it or because we think we're following a science. And so one of the things that chap chapter five argues is that the, the rise of a highly militarized police form, which started to take hold say around the 1970s, a shift away from a rehabilitative model, what historians and sociologists think of as a rehabilitative model that was dominant in mid-century, where yes, you policed crime, but you also thought of crime as a complex problem with other facets like um, education, poverty, et cetera, et cetera. We largely started to shift in the 1970s, both on the left and the right, by the way, in the United States, into a model that instead said um, that crime is mostly an issue for police. And a lot of how that switch happened, or at least one of the arguments I make in the book, is through social scientific theories. Uh, what you mention is, is one, one such theory. Um, there's a lot that could be said here, but basically what I argue in chapter five is that there were different uh, race neutral or colorblind concepts that appear like scientific concepts, but that in fact have racial implications. So the chapter starts with Eric Garner, um, who very sadly, you know, on video, he's, he's kind of a precursor, one of many, many precursors, forerunners uh, to, the, to the death of George Floyd. Uh, he, was, he was basically put in chokehold for selling Lucy cigarettes. Lucy cigarettes are an item that is popular to sell in poor neighborhoods. As different um, social policy was enacted to discourage people from smoking, 
in places like the state of New York, the taxes became very high on tobacco products. One of, I think, the maybe unintended consequences of this, I don't know, we could have a discussion about that, was that poor people who were smokers could, it was very cost prohibitive for them to buy an entire pack of cigarettes. So it became common to break the law in a particular small, I would argue, small way in poor neighborhoods, often brown or blacker neighborhoods, which is by selling Lucy's or these little cigarettes one by one, tax free, tax exempt mm -hmm. on the black market. That's what Eric Garner was doing uh, when he was put in this chokehold in broad daylight on the sidewalk and, and he died. He said 11 times or something like that, I can't breathe. You know, the, the video went viral. What was happening there is that New York City had socialized and organized its policing policy for the years prior around broken windows theory. And broken windows had this notion of disorder that came from the social sciences. James Q. Wilson was the big political scientist. He actually used to be a Pepperdine. He's, he's passed away, but I'm a Pepperdine mm -hmm. too. And so here I am sort of criticizing uh, one of my fellow, fellow Pepperdine scholars, but he made this argument extremely influential that if you allowed small amounts of disorder to proliferate in a community, you were inviting big crimes. And so what you needed was zero tolerance on disorder. So what happened is the police were socialized in this idea that broken windows, that was his famous metaphor in an Atlantic article, broken windows, so little signs of quote unquote disorder in a, in a neighborhood uh, were correlated scientifically with things like murder, assault, rape, and that you needed to have zero tolerance on those. And if you didn't show zero tolerance on them, then you were inviting uh, sort of mayhem, anarchy, violence, and crime. What's wrong with this? Well, one thing that's wrong with this that hermeneutics, reading social realities, cultural meanings can show us is disorder is not a colorblind concept. Whose disorder counts? So a poor person's crime is to sell these Lucy cigarettes. Rich person's crime in where I am in West LA is to not pay taxes on their gardener. The state loses far more money from the tax evasion from some of my wealthy neighbors than it does from Eric Garner selling his Lucy cigarettes. But you're not going to see police tackle people and put them into a chokehold because of the disorder of evading taxes um, on their gardener, right? So it, it's a big topic, but if you start reading the social science text, because James Q. Wilson's saying, look, I'm just giving you a descriptive theory. There's this thing called disorder. I'm describing it scientifically. I'm a hard-nosed empiricist. If you just read it that way, it looks value neutral. But if you read it with, as a hermeneuticist, what you see is that there's certain cultural meanings and that you're actually creating or inaugurating a kind of world, a world in which you police it with zero tolerance and maybe even heavily militarized force. In the United States, poverty correlates with, with race. And so what you end up doing is policing poor browner and blacker people really in a militarized fashion uh, that doesn't happen in other communities. Very interesting. So I, I wanna dig in on this word theory, right? And it's the broken windows theory. Um, and the perceived neutrality of the social sciences, right? So, so in the world in which I work, for example, uh, we claim uh, X, Y, and Z programs for young children and their families work because we have uh, evidence that is neutral uh, and the, the, the techniques of, of collecting that evidence are often drawn from either the natural sciences or, or medical research, right? The randomized controlled trial, for example. And I think part of what I'm hearing you say is that there is a layer of meaning, uh, or maybe several layers of meaning, beyond the evidence uh, collected from techniques drawn from the science and hard sciences, medical, medical sciences, and that sort of thing, that uh, these theories are frankly uh, ignoring and then policymakers take those theories up and they implement policies without having uh, read them uh, interpretively. Is that is that accurate? Absolutely. So one of the central claims of the book, um, and I think you put it well, is that what appear to be simply factual descriptive claims are often, in fact, ideological and cultural ones. I'm not saying you have to say it in a day, day like this, in an age like this. I'm not saying there aren't facts. I'm not saying that there aren't, we can't have better or worse accounts of the world. That's not my position. What I'm saying is that often in the social sciences, 
um, theories are quite complicated because they have these meaning making dimensions. And so something like disorder doesn't, it's when you operationalize it, when you try to, first of all, just cognitively get a grasp on what counts as disorder. Does, does someone jumping turnstiles for, to get into the New York subway count as disorder? Does drinking on the corner count as disorder? Um, does having an underage party in your nice lawn uh, where no one can see behind a tall hedge count as disorder? Or does that just mean you know young people acting out a little bit? Are you going to send in the SWAT team on them? Or are you going to send the SWAT team in on you know what's going on in the ghetto? All of that. So to operationalize the term disorder, to, it's not self-interpreting, right? Um, you have to you have to do some work to decipher its meaning or significance for our social and political lives. And often what happens in the rush to claim that what, we're, what we have is a policy that's just straight scientific and neutral is that we're actually muting or hiding these ideological components that we should be debating openly. We should be having a discussion over uh, you know, the, the meaning-making features of our policy and our theories. And I think one of the things that's done a lot of damage that, uh, that is, is one of the central theses of the hermeneutic tradition is the notion that social science is like the natural sciences. And so that when you offer theories, you're just offering descriptions and the world exists in sort of splendid isolation from your descriptions. You know, if I give a description of the heliocentric theory of the universe, for instance, the sun, I, I say this in the book, the sun doesn't suddenly change positions because I get it wrong. But something like the sun changing positions happens in the social sciences because social scientific theory can penetrate our lives through our self-interpretations and how we organize our institutions, what kind of selves we could become. There's a lot of ways in which this can happen. So yeah, I think something important that emerges here is that the book is an argument against technocracy or rule by supposedly value neutral science. I don't think there is such a thing as a rule by value neutral science because I think the creation and um, political dwelling that human beings do is always a question for ethical and moral life and for democratic deliberation for all of us to have a say about and not just something that experts, technocrats is, is a term for rule by experts or um, scientific authorities. They, they, can't, they can't short circuit that without actually uh, slipping into sort of pseudoscience or scientism. Um, we dwell in stories, we live stories, and stories are open to contestation and deliberation by ordinary people. Uh, scientists, for whatever good they do, and they do a lot of good, I, I happen to think, um, they can't actually short circuit that. And unfortunately in our society, there's a perennial tendency in modern society to return to these technocratic modes where people are really making a power grab and going beyond what social scientific theory can justly um, grant them. That, that's that's very good. Thank you. I, I did want to pause at this time and, and mention that, that we are taking your questions from the audience. Uh, they are available. Uh, there is a chat box available on the, the YouTube page. So please uh, put your questions in there. We're monitoring that and um, we look forward to, to answering your questions as well as mine. Um, Jason, I want to shift to talk a little bit about how this uh, impacts the economy. Um, and in particular, you talk about the idea of the market as a self-correcting machine or an invisible hand, which really, to my mind, that, that, that is the central mythology of uh, modern economics. And it's played an outsized role in our politics, uh, particularly in the last 40 years since the Reagan-Thatcher uh, revolution in the early 1980s. So my question is, first, is that true? Is, is the market uh, completely neutral? Is it... Uh, simply an invisible hand, uh, guided by an invisible hand, I should say. And, and secondly, what does that mean for the role of government in uh, both curbing the abuses, perhaps, of the economy and, and actors in the economy, and also protecting the vulnerable, uh, which is you know, certainly a concern uh, of, of ours, as we um, know that, that children um, are frankly, um, uh, vulnerable in, in, in an economy that, that seems to be governed uh, in a very laissez-faire way. Um, and, and, and it's not a place where children have a voice. And so it's something that we're, we're very interested uh, in. Yeah, that's, that's a great set of questions. Um, 
So I think one issue here is, it, it might be helpful to, to give a, an example and start with your second question. One of the arguments I make in, in the chapters on economy, there are chapters on, um, on different forms of coercive force, like policing. Uh, there's, there's a chapter on, on global uh, military force and the way social science interacts with that. The opening two chapters are in economy. And one of the examples I use in there is the, the um, I'm quite hard on, uh, sorry for people who find the scandals, I'm quite hard on the voucherized uh, school of choice movement in the United States, which took hold uh, within the last 50 years. Um, why? Well, in part because I think that even those who have good intentions behind the school of choice movement, and I do believe there are people who have good intentions behind school of choice and voucherized, um, voucher, voucherized schooling, this is the whole movement where what you do is you say, uh, we're going to maybe make funding portable and we'll let students and their parents choose which school they want to go to on the basis of which curriculum they like, which school they think is flourishing or succeeding. And so the idea behind this, the theory behind this, where economics comes in is you treat public schools more and more like a quasi market where the students and their parents are customers. The schools are conceived of metaphorically as businesses, and then they can move their tax funding portably around. Now, people like Milton Friedman, who wrote a really early paper, uh, The Economist, the, the famous uh, Nobel laureate economist, University of Chicago, wrote a famous early paper arguing in favor of voucherization of schools in this fashion. He argued that it was going to make for a more dynamic um, schooling environment, but he also argued that it was going to make for more quality of access. And we now know that actually the reverse has happened, where voucherization has happened. Why? Places like Detroit, Nevada, there's reportage that, and, and studies that I, that I cite in the book. Well, what happens is if you treat schools like businesses, then the failing schools, the quote unquote failing schools, the schools that don't do well at testing, and by the way, you end up with a very reductive notion of what it means to do well or poorly as a school. But the schools that are failing are treated as sort of businesses that should go out of business. And so you end up like shuttering schools. But if you look at the wider cultural context, as hermeneutics would ask us to do, what you see is that um, oftentimes poor schools for various complicated reasons have more difficulty in sort of pioneering innovative, um, innovative curriculum. Their parents who are under much more economic stress have a lot more difficulty in choosing schools. They might not have the time or the means to get to a school across town. They might themselves lack the education to treat schooling like a market. And so what's happened where schools have been treated marketized for lack of a better term, is that the wealthier schools have had more and more money aggregated toward them. So the state has sort of redistributed money up the ladder. At least that's the argument I, I, I make in the book. I suggest that what we have is actually state redistribution upward, which has something to do with the galloping inequality that characterizes the United States today. Mm -hmm. And in other places, like in Detroit, we hear these reports of educational deserts where they shut down the traditional public schools in their area on the basis that they failed by testing standards. And so you have parents who have no schooling nearby. And so, um, the, now, there are, of course, the cases where you have a, a, a successful charter school in a poor, poor district, but it favors, the, it favors the students who are already coming from families and places where the resources or at least the know-how is there to get the kids to school. And all this is being done, Friedman argued way back in the 1950s, that this was just a science of economics. And so to circle around to your first question, I never think of this as just a science of economics. It's, it's a cultural thing we do. Do we treat schools like a public good? That would be my preferred option. I mean, we'd have to have the debate and the discussion, but just to give you a contrast point, do we treat it as a public good that we generously fund because we see it as a necessary condition to being a democratic citizen, a deliberative, thoughtful, democrat, informed democratic citizen, small d here, or do we instead decide to marketize it, which is what we've done from the 1970s? And, and I think what I would say to people who are very enthusiastic about vouchers is to sit with the fact that the, the opposite seems to have happened of what they wanted, at least if the stated purpose, presume good faith, presume that the purpose wasn't a nefarious attempt to just funnel money at rich kids, right? And have them have their public schools look more and more like private schools, right? Um, say that there's not a nefarious intent there, though there are certainly people who have nefarious intents in our world. Um, even if you have a good intention behind the voucherized movement, the, the language of markets, the theory of markets actually helped us build a reality 
that is highly problematic and that if we just say that's the scientific way of doing it, vouchers are the economic scientific way of doing it, we're short circuiting the debate. We're not really actually having a discussion of what's the proper culture and what are the proper meanings around schools. That should be open for debate. And instead we're sort of ruled by technocrats, by economic experts and, their popu and a popular base if they have one, which they have had at times. I think there's been a backlash against some of that popular base, but um, instead of a democracy, a real, a real dialogue and debate over, over what schooling ought to be culturally as a set of meanings. So I, on that point, I mean, I'm just curious, like there, you, you do in the book affirm the value of the social sciences, right? There's, yes. there's certainly a role to play. Um, you know, I, I look at an issue like vouchers and uh, there are people on the right primarily who trot, uh, trot out um, uh, evidence, right? There's evidence that it works. And there are people on the left who say, no, there's evidence that it doesn't work. And, and, and when we're just competing, you know, with competing sets of evidence, when we're having a discussion with competing sets of evidence, it, it really, it, it, it locks us into, um, you know, sort of permanent intransigence. You, you know, there's no way to get past the issue. And so you have, you know, Republican states doing things one way and Democratic states doing another way. What is the, the role? What should be the right interplay, though, between social scientists who are, for example, studying the effect of vouchers on, on public education and political leadership, which at least to my mind is responsible for representing us in some sort of moral and ethical deliberation at the highest levels of government to say, you know, while it may work in this way or that way, or it may not work in these other ways, what this really needs to be about, the discussion we really need to have is around schools as a public good, just as, as one example. So, so how would you recommend, right, for example, policymakers, elected officials, using evidence um, without short-circuiting the moral, ethical, democratic deliberation that you say also needs to happen? Yeah, I think that, so I'm very sympathetic to what's called the deliberative turn in public policy. I have an earlier book with um, Mark Beaver, who's a, who's a political theorist at the University of California, Berkeley. It's called Interpretive Social Science. It came out in 2018. And there we have a chapter where we argue that public policy should follow, that people who, who see hermeneutic insights into, into social reality should, should advocate for a, for a deliberative turn in public policy. The deliberative turn in public policy holds that we have to be really alive in democratic societies to the way that public policy always has a story it's telling. There are always villains and heroes. Everyone's doing this. There's always some narrative goal that we're trying to accomplish. And sometimes, unfortunately, what happens, I think, on both the left and the right in the United States, at least amongst their technocratic wings, the wings that are attracted to this way of talking and thinking about politics, because I think they're anti-technocratic wings um, on both the left and the right in the United States as well. I think they're minority movements, but there are technic anti-technocratic wings. Um, unfortunately, we tend to get bewitched by, by the term evidence. And what we're really doing with evidence is sometimes trying to tell a story. And uh, we should be a lot clearer on what's doing the work. So yeah, we should be having a debate over over some of the facts involved. Like, are there educational deserts in Detroit or did 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 Jason Blakely just sell me false news? You know, um, is, that, is that alternative facts? So we could have a debate about, are there educational deserts? Are there people living in poor neighborhoods in Detroit right now that don't have public schools near them anymore? They've been shuttered up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if I were wrong on that, by the way, if I'm wrong on the empirical question, then I need to correct that. Um, but then we also need to see the storytelling, the storytelling element, so the narrative. Uh, DeVos, who's a, you know, the, the current education secretary, she tells a story about how if you voucherize education, it's going to become like Google and Facebook. And she was saying that five years ago when people still wanted to be like Google and Facebook. No, I'm not so sure they wanted to be like Google <laughs> and Facebook, but, um, you know, and every school would, would be a Silicon Valley, uh, you know, success story where, where you have entrepreneurial spirit and gumption coming through. Um, unfortunately, a lot of what goes on is that um, the language of evidence is often being used in such a way where we're not, we're not debating the story. And by the way, the story, I think, democratizes part of the deliberative policy turn 
in political science holds that um, stories are a genre form. I have, I have a toddler that even children understand, uh, which is part of our skepticism about it when we become captive to and sort of overly impressed with the natural sciences for all the good that they do. And they do a tremendous amount of good. We tend to think uh, stories are things for children or they're things for prehistoric people. Stories don't have insight. Hermeneutics holds no, stories are ineliminable from our political life. And so part of how we do this is we're just more open about the story or stories we are telling, right? And, and so uh, the story I would wanna tell about education is one in which democracy is not just about creative destruction. It's not the Silicon Valley. You don't bankrupt schools that are doing poorly. That's a terrible idea. That's just punishing the people who need even more help. That's an unmerciful, unneighborly policy in my opinion. Why? Because the story I'm telling is one about democratic inclusion and participation. And so I, I think we need to sort of state our stories. DeVos is telling a story about let's make everything more and more like a market, more and more like an economy. Let's treat teachers like they're business people. Let's teach students like their customers, which by the way, as a teacher, I think is a, a corruptive practice inside the classroom. There's a lot more mm -hmm. that can be said here. It is not a healthy relationship between teacher and student when the student thinks that they are yelping, Yelp reviewing you. It's not a healthy relationship when they think they're consuming you the way they consumed something from Amazon. It's an educative relationship that has a different, I would wanna argue ought to have a different culture and set of meanings around it than those of a market. But in order to have that discussion, I'm short circuiting it if I say my evidence just proves my story. You never can just give neutral evidence that proves your story. The evidence can help along, it can substantiate, but the story always exceeds the evidence because we are free creatures. We're not just atoms floating in space. We're not just chemical compounds. And so we can decide to live another story. And so, um, and that is one of the central insights of hermeneutic philosophies that human beings are storytelling creatures and we live out stories. And so part of the drama of being human is we have to, we have to dialogue about our stories. And we have to realize that, uh, that our stories are challengeable. We're not gonna have the scientific, um, a, a scientific expert or authority who kind of takes that responsibility away from us. Great, Jason, we do have some questions coming in here from our audience and I, I'm, they're, they're somewhat unfiltered. I haven't been able to, to, to read them and vet them myself. So I'm just gonna read them here as we go. Uh, question number one, how, how do you connect education and leisure as the ways to exit the automatic mind? And this person very helpfully gave us a citation to page 83 of your book. Um, and I, in this person comments, I think more than ever, we need to exit the automatic mind. So talk to us about the automatic mind and the role of education and leisure in exiting that. Sure, that is a, that is a great question. That's a very, very thoughtful question. Uh, thank you for that. So that is coming out of the, one of the chapters, I have a chapter on policing, chapter on international military policy, chapters on economics. This question is coming out of a chapter on managerialism and different social sciences that have been used to justify managerial approaches to our relationships, which I argue are somewhat manipulative ways um, to treat each other. Yes, at a personal level, things like uh, self-help and, and how we treat our relationships of love and friendship things like self-help, but this question is coming from a part where I discuss what's happened to democracy under the influence of certain social scientific theories. The automatic mind is a term that comes out of Thaler and Sunstein's extremely popular book, Nudge. Mm -hmm. um, Sunstein actually became a public policy figure within the Obama administration. And um, basically what he argued was that behavioral psychology and behavioral economics showed that most human, that all human beings have irrational biases, right? So there's a kind of empirical claim, here are the facts. And then I as a hermeneuticist wanna say, be careful, here come the meanings too, right? Mm -hmm. So the facts are we all have biases. We, we make irrational decisions. One example he gives is we tend to follow a herd mentality. So he argues that human beings tend to often do what others do because they think it's a shortcut to making a right decision. So if we see people clustering around a decision, we make that decision too. So that's an example of the automatic mind. That's an example of people sort of irrationally hurting around something. Works a lot of the time as a shortcut cognitively, but they learn Sunstein say it can be spectacularly bad at other times. Their recommendation is, the recommendation for this is that we have certain public policy experts that they call choice architects who design our institutional spaces 
for us in order to nudge us, to push our irrational decision-making in the right direction, to treat us as sort of nudgeable objects. Um, so the question here is, what does it mean to exit the automatic mind? Like who gets to not be irrational? And I think one of the things that's happened in our society uh, that's a sort of different stream of politics is that democracy has largely been replaced with a rival conception of democracy that has to do with rule by sort of elite managers, um, which I sort of consider Sunstein and Thaler to be examples of this, right? Where less and less decisions are made by us at the local level, democracy is in increasingly something that this is the whole Tocquevillian position for those who read the history of political thought that you have two forms of democracy you have a deliberative form, which clearly I'm very sympathetic to where people, democracy is a participatory sport. And if you're not participating, you're not doing democracy. And then there's a kind of uh, conception democracy where it's mostly passive and you watch and you vote every four years. And then you have the real experts, the politicians and their administrations make most of your choices for you. And so politics is sort of reduced to these sort of voting moments. Um, what struck me reading Nudge, not only that Sunstein was at the highest levels of government, um, but also that this book was so popular was that Nudge treated its readers and, and the authors as though they were kind of able to overcome their irrationalities, at least momentarily in order to, to deliberate over what our political life should look like. How were they able to do that? Well, through education and through leisure. They were given the time to do that. You know, Thaler and Sunstein are, are professors at ultra prestigious institutions. Sunstein's at Harvard, I forget where Thaler is, maybe University of Chicago or something. Um, and so what you end up having is a sort of unintentional justification or maybe intentional justification of rule by Ivy League elites, mm -hmm. you know, where the masses of us are just trying to survive and voting every four years, but more and more choices look like they're made by someone else far, far away. Um, and so I think this question of the automatic mind comes to something close that Capita cares about, which is what would it look like to have an educational culture that is healthy for democracy? And unfortunately, uh, Thaler and Sunstein, under the guise of science, actually end up advocating for what I think is a highly defective story of what democracy is, where only some people get to overcome their cognitive biases. Um, and the rest of us mostly just wallow in our cognitive biases and vote every four years. Um, so I, I, I think there's a lot more I could say there, but I, I guess I just wanna flag that educationally, I think the, I'm interested in the way that hermeneutics points to what's necessary for a free person. What's the education necessary for a free person? I think part of what's necessary is is hermeneutic or cultural interpretive ability, the ability to interpret social reality. And if we don't lavishly offer that education to people, in part because we're treating education as a business, business deal where failing institutions just get bad educations um, and funding yanked, if we're not lavishly giving that, then we should expect to see our democratic institutions trembling and crumbling because people don't have the sort of education anymore that they need and the leisure that they need in order to deliberate, in order to participate, that's being left for fewer and fewer of us to do. So why, Jason, is rule by elites, I'm gonna ask you to sort of make the case here for deliberative democracy. It seems like rule by, rule by elites may be preferred to uh, sort of a, a more populist uh, rule by everyone, right? Like, I, I mean, I probably agree with Cass Sunstein more often than I agree with my uh, uh, Trump-loving neighbors here in Western North Carolina. So, so why should I prefer the deliberative version versus the uh, rule by Cass Sun Sunstein? Yeah, that's a good question. And there are various ways into that. Um, one would be because you ha I would have to persuade you of a commitment to the notion that human beings as having a certain kind of dignity um, are being condescended to if they're not participating, if they're not having a say in their institutions. These are my democratic commitments, my commitments to democratic polity. That I think that 
we infantilize people if we don't let them have a say in what their community looks like. I also think we often get um, politics badly wrong. The experts get it badly wrong. And you could read my book um, as just a litany of things that the social science experts get badly wrong. The 2008 financial crisis, um, the, the war on terror and sort of um, global imperialism, the, uh, the mil militarized policing. So I, I often think the experts get things very badly wrong. I also don't think they have the kinds of explanations in hand that they, they think they do. I don't think that people are nudgeable, as nudgeable as, as, as Thaler and, and Sunstein do. I don't think we're just nudgeable objects. I think we can confound experts. At the same time, so, so populists need to be given their due. At the same time, I'm not really comfortable with the term populist because part of what I argue in the book is that these sort of um, pseudoscientific claims to power have a popular base. And part of what I see in the Trump movement is actually a kind of technocracy that's been popularized through books like Freakonomics, uh, that it's just, it's just a science that you have to organize institutions in this manner, right? And so I actually think they're sort of folk, what I would call folk naturalisms, or they're folk pseudosciences. The, the, the pseudoscientific technocratic polity is not just something that comes from the top down. There are bottom-up versions of it. And so we need to be careful and parse through. It's not as simple as an elites versus populists. I do think there's something to that narrative. And one of the reasons we need to listen carefully is because elite governance through marketization and through different things I argue in the book has failed spectacularly in various ways. I mean, we are more unequal society now economically uh, than we've been in generations. And people are feeling the pressure economically. And yet we had an expert economic science telling us for the last 50 years, keep putting in these policies and all boats will rise. People don't perceive their situation as all boats rose. They think Jeff Bezos boats boat rose and they're underwater now. Mm -hmm. So we're not getting the outcomes that technocrats promised. Um, technocratic rule has failed. And the, the, one, the one affirmation I wanna give to quote unquote populism of the left and the right is that um, people perceive that there's something that's gone badly awry in the governance of their lives. Is there a lot of racial scapegoating? Is there a lot of magical thinking? Is there a lot of hatred that's taken hold too? Yes, uh, but we have to think carefully and dialectically through why people have re reached such a sense of malaise. We have to, and I have one version that I'm arguing of, of what might be there that's, that needs to be taken into account. Um, yeah. I hope that's not too much. Yeah, no, that's that's great. So uh, another question here from the audience, uh, is history a social science? And um, if not, what is it? And can, be his, can history be applied more in creating interventions for uh, wicked social problems? Yes, I, I think history is the queen of the social sciences. I think McIntyre says that. I, not only do I think history is a social science, I think all the social sciences done correctly are historical. Mm -hmm. um, social science ought to be universally hermeneutic. Uh, social science ought to be radically revamped toward interpretive acumen. We still use our methods. I'm actually not, I, I might sound more radical than I am methodologically. I think we can still use things like mass surveys, along with things like ethnographies. I don't think we just have to get rid of all the quantitative. I'm not, mm -hmm. not anti-quantitative. What I'm against is the notion that the quantitative supersedes or eliminates interpretation. And history is the horizon of all the social sciences. History is the horizon of all the social sciences because the social sciences are comprised of cultural meanings. And cultural meanings come and go on a historical horizon. We interpretively create new worlds. Human beings are very strange creatures. We dwell in our meanings, meanings we created together, things like currencies, things like democratic institutions, uh, things like monarchy don't exist anymore, mm -hmm. right? We dwell in worlds, Pharaoh, et cetera. We dwell in worlds of meaning. And so in order to really have a, a fully realized social science, it must become a historical social science because the meanings that we study as social scientists, be we sociologists or psychologists, need to be related back to a horizon that's historical. So if I'm a psychologist, I need to ask myself, why are so many people depressed? Another question that comes up in the book, why do so many people have what I'm calling ADHD? 
uh, there's a tendency by psychologists to be very historical, ahistorical, just, mm -hmm. wow, everyone's hyperactive now. And not ask the question, why was hyperactivity not even pathologized in past societies? And that's just bad psychology. Human psychology is historicized. So we need to, we, we, I'm, I'm not advocating dismissing biological insights and the insights of mainstream psychology. What I'm saying is mainstream psychology needs to be couched in something much bigger. And I, I agree with the, the, the question there. The, the bigger is history. The bigger there is, is, is the meanings that shape and form worlds is history does history also belong in it sounds like you're saying history also belongs in the humanities right it, it should straddle the humanities and the social sciences as it, an interpretive discipline there should be no distinction anymore between the humanities and the social sciences the social sciences should be reconceived as the humanities and so for people who aren't familiar with academia and its various disciplinary divisions the humanities are clear clear disciplines in the humanities are things like literature history, philosophy, uh, film, art history. One of the arguments of hermeneutics, one of the suggestions I make in the book is that social sciences, along with them, the mass surveys, all, all the tools we have in the social sciences ought to be conceived of as a branch of the humanities where what we need to be able to do, what literary scholars do is they interpret texts. If someone came and told you, I've got a scientific interpretation of Shakespeare and here are the facts, you'd say they're insane or very clunky reader of Shakespeare and very bad at it. It doesn't, it doesn't entail relativism. What it means is you've got, to, you've got to develop the art of interpretation, which is how I defined hermeneutics. You have to develop the art of interpretation if you're gonna interpret Hamlet. You know, Hamlet says, the time is out of joint, oh cursed spite that ever I was born to make it right. What the heck does that mean, the time is out of joint? I need to use a terper of acumen. You relate it to other things Hamlet says. I need to relate it to the rest of the play. I need to relate it to Shakespearean theater. I need to relate it to the Elizabethan world. I need to do interpretive work. Same thing with the social sciences. What does it mean when someone holds a sign up that says, make America great again, or feel the burn? I need to do interpretive work. That's, that's my view is that the view of hermeneutics is that the social sciences simply rightly understood are a humanity. They're not a, a natural science, that you're not gonna get laws that predict our behavior. We're creative self-interpreting animals. Instead, what you're gonna get are interpretive stories. And historians have always done that, right? Yeah, they've got facts they worry about, but they're also competing about what the right story of the past is. Social scientists should be people who are competing over what the right story of the present is, in my view. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, two other questions here that I'm gonna ask back to back from the audience. Uh, they both pertain to curriculum. Uh, there continues to be a large push to institute universal standards like Common Core for all grade levels that teachers have to implement. And these standards are empirically based, value neutral, skills divorced from meanings or values. Uh, do you find these standards to be insidious ways to reinforce an epistemic ignorance of meanings? That's question number one. And question number two is curriculum and therefore testing inherently advantaging those who are already advantaged? That is, why are schools held accountable to test scores that are maybe unfair to them? Wow, I wish I could see the people out there. We're getting some good questions. There's no joke there. Appreciate uh, all you people who are out there. If we were in an actual room, you would, <laughs> yeah. you would of course, but if yeah, we yeah. were in an actual room, we probably wouldn't have this particular gathering of people either. So. Plus, yeah, plus I, I, yeah, exactly. I love the, 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 the scattering of people from all over the United States. That, um, that's a great question. Uh, standardized tests. Yeah, that's another example, right? I mean, it's a little bit like the school voucherization there, I would say it's a different social science that's being evoked, though I think it interfaces with what I call the market polis in the book. Um, so standardized tests, right? The idea there is that uh, you can have certain competencies that you test for, um, and that when you do that, you're getting an objective read on how good or bad the teacher is. By the way, I had a, my twin sister uh, was a high school public high school teacher in Colorado. And she said, that's like if you tell the gym teacher that if a kid can't run a mile in under eight minutes, that that's the gym teacher's fault, you know? But, you know, as an English teacher, you're saying, the fact that you can't do X, Y, and Z is, is the English teacher's fault. Um, the problem with, with standardized testing uh, treated as, as sort of value neutral is that it's only one way to do education. 
And it's a way to do education that is very tightly tied to a politics of outcomes. I happen to think it's also tied to the market polis. I don't think the market polis like Friedman and Hayek and different people I discuss in the book, I don't think it gave us a reduced state. I think people, libertarians and so on, have not caught up to the fact that the state that was born out of the wreckage of the old New Deal state, the social democratic state, the market state that came to power electorally with people like Reagan and Thatcher, but was also advanced by people like um, Bill Clinton, that state is not a state with less bureaucracy. It's a state with different bureaucracy. It's a state with different kinds of um, intervention in local communities. And one of those is standardized tests where what you say is, I'm gonna create quasi markets where I discipline people for their outcomes, for their productivity. And I'm gonna find a measure that I can quantify across communities that will tell me who's succeeding and who's failing. And then I'll discipline people like on a market because they're lazy bureaucrats. And if, they, if the teacher is a lazy bureaucrat is getting bad test outcomes, that's their fault. And so they should either lose their job have a stern talking to, or you know, have defunding happen or something like that. Um, so I think this is another one of these cases where the testing is loaded with different cultural meanings. Of course, many, many people have commented on the way that tests have cultural bias. You know, if you're, if you're in rural Arkansas, um, we know that p certain people test better. Uh, we know you can get better at the tests by practicing them. I mean, that should already sort of raise some alarm bells. Also, just as a deliberative Democrat, I, I reject the notion that uh, that we don't take seriously people's ability to formulate educational policy at the local level for themselves. I think I should have a lot more of a say on how my children are educated um, with my neighbors and that it shouldn't just be, be left to standardization. I do think that, I think it already came out that I think there's an inherent advantage in standardized testing. Um, it's not that you can never ever use standardized testing. That's not my point. My point is that standardized testing is not just an objective scientific tool. That's, that's, that's clunky, hermeneutics should get rid of that. Standardized testing is a cultural artifact. It's one way of doing education. I happen to think it's a rather um, anti-democratic, centralized, clunky way of doing it. You might think it's good, but let's at least have a di dialogue over, not you, Joe, but like you out there might think it's good, but let's have a discussion over it as a cultural practice, not as a supposed like scientific way of doing education, um, that just resolves our conflicts for us. Wonderful. Uh, Jason, this has been fun. Thank you. I have two final questions. Uh, and, and the very last question we ask all of our guests uh, at Capita. But the first question I want to ask you is, what is the question I should have asked you? And what is the answer to that question? <laughs> What is the question I should have asked you? What is the answer to that question? I don't know, because one of the things I really like about questions is the encounter with another that's not me. You know, what I love about questions, one of the reasons I love to be a teacher is um, the classroom is boring if I treat it as always the same, you know, if I think, if I treat it like a monologue. Um, but the question, the question, you know, the etymology there of the quest of a person who's questing, who's on a journey, uh, what I love about questions is they come out of a quest, they come out of a journey, out of someone's life, out of someone's story, if you want to put it hermeneutically. Mm. Um, so I, I actually, it's very boring for me to pose questions to myself. Um, I find much more interesting when, when people out of their questing, you know, pose a question, question to me um, about, about what's bothering them, about what's troubling them, about what they think I don't see, about what they think my blind spots are, or what I'm saying incorrectly. Um, Sorry, I, I sort of am dodging. The no, 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 no. That 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 is the that is the type of response that we. I hope that question elicits. So, um, you definitely you definitely uh, you definitely answered answered something there. Um, our last question is always: What is one project you've dreamed of but haven't started yet? I'm working on. Uh, what, what uh, philosophers call genealogy right now of naturalism. Naturalism is this movement that I'm against, which holds that you can reduce the explanation of human behavior to the natural sciences. Um, and uh, against naturalism, I'm in favor of hermeneutics. Um, and a genealogy is a, is a philosophical history where you go back to a time before something emerged. And I'm, I'm, I'm working right now uh, very slowly because of COVID and it's, it's just getting off the ground on a genealogy or philosophical history of when did it emerge and why did it emerge this notion that we should try to just explain people 
by the models, concepts, and ideas of the natural sciences, and what came before it. And I'm interested in the humanistic forms that came before it, people like St. Thomas More, Shakespeare, uh, Pico, Mirandola, um, different humanists, Erasmus, that were just prior to and just around the time of the natural science revolution, where I think a lot of people got mystified a little bit by so much that's good about the natural sciences. And we start to neglect the human. And I think this neglect of the human has led to a lot of the pathologies that, that we've been talking about. I think that um, modern people are very peculiar in that we've turned science, which is a very good thing, a, a very admirable thing into its opposite, a kind of superstition and a kind of power. Mm -hmm. And that we've done that by extending it beyond its boundaries. And so I'm interested in continuing to explore that problem, but through genealogy and, and by returning to, to uh, Northern and Southern humanist sources in, in Europe. Great. Well, we, we will look forward to that. Uh, Jason Blakely, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you all to our guests. Uh, last plug that I have to give, I would not be doing my job if I did not ask uh, you out there to help us build a future in which all children and families flourish. Uh, you can do so by going to count the social backslash give. Uh, we appreciate your financial contributions and they will be put to swift and efficient use. Uh, again, Jason, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our guests today. We hope you have a great rest of the afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.